this evening. You can return your Bibles to uh, Hebrews chapter 7, and we're going to pick up at the point that we uh, left off with last week there at verse 11. Uh, before we do that, though, just a, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, first of all, um, I want to thank Adam Higginbotham. I've been meaning to do that for uh, several weeks now. Um, Adam's done a, just a fantastic job of uh, setting up our Zoom uh, studies. Um, not only that, he's recording them and putting them on our Facebook page and putting them on the, our YouTube channel. Uh, and that's a valuable resource. There's a, a lot of people who are studying from those, uh, looking at them uh, sometime in the future. And uh, I, I just want to give a shout out and appreciate Adam for uh, for doing that. I know that's uh, uh, that's very helpful to, uh, to all of us, probably more so than any of us realizes. Uh, secondly, to let everybody know, uh, this afternoon when we got home from church, uh, I got a phone call. Uh, my boss has tested positive for COVID. Uh, he is symptomatic. And so uh, I'll be quarantined for the next 10 days, but just want to let everybody know I was wearing a mask this morning, uh, wore it all through the service, but just want to let everybody know. Uh, I, I don't have any symptoms. Um, certainly I'll let everybody know if I do or if I test positive. All right, let's get in now to chapter seven. Um, and I think it's always good for us to kind of review just a little bit uh, what we have talked about last week. We came back to the idea of the Melchizedek and high priesthood. Uh, the author of Hebrews had introduced that idea back in chapter 5, and that's where he'd stopped at verse 10, and he said, there's deeper things that I want to talk to you about, uh, but it's going to be hard for me to do that because you haven't been progressing, uh, growing as you need to. Uh, but then he went on to uh, talk about that, you know, after warning him the danger of, of uh, being neglectful of their studies, that he was convinced of better things for them. And then in chapter 7, he went back to that subject, and he's going to introduce those deeper things for them. Um, and what we looked at last week was really looking at Melchizedek. We really didn't talk about Jesus at all. We were talking about Melchizedek and the, um, uh, the, the foundation of what we're going to see about Jesus today based on who Melchizedek was. And the author uh, devoted these first 10 verses into really talking about what makes Melchizedek unique, what makes him special, uh, as he described him, as great. Um, and if those things are true about Melchizedek, then one who arises to be a priest after the same order is, by definition, uh, great himself. And now what the author is going to do here in the latter part of chapter 7 is he's going to introduce Jesus as that high priest according to the order of Melchizedek and what that means for uh, these Jewish Christians to whom he is writing. Uh, so keep that in mind when we start looking at the arguments that he's going to lay out. They're all based on this idea of Jesus being a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And as I'll remind you, that comes from Psalm 110 in verse 4, um, one of the most significant uh, messianic messages that's found in the Old Testament is this oath of God. And the author is going to emphasize the significance of this oath, this oath of God that the Messiah would be a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. All right, so that brings us now to uh, verse 11. And what he's going to do is talk about the idea of a new line of priests, what this will mean um, for all of those who understood and were very comfortable with, had grown up under, uh, had lived their lives under the law of Moses. What does this oath of God that was made to his Messiah, his son, what does that mean for them uh, and their view of the law of Moses? Well, he says in verse 11, if perfection uh, was found through Levitical priesthood, and he says in parentheses, for on the basis of it, the people received the law. So I want you to see right now there's a connection. There's a connection that's drawn between the priesthood and the law. And the fact is that the priesthood derives its authority, derives its existence uh, from the law. 
And when I say derives authority and derives existence, I'm saying the same thing. Uh, the word that is translated authority uh, literally means to be or allowed to be. It's a variation of the, the basic Greek verb to be. Uh, and it, the idea of authority is just simply that which is allowed to be. So to have an authority for a priesthood, you must have some something that allows it to be. And what allows it to be is the law. Uh, Aaron became a priest by the designation of the law of Moses. We're going to talk just a little bit about that um, later on as we get into the class. So that's what the writer is saying. Perfection, uh, if it came through the Levitical priesthood, because the Levitical priesthood derives its authority from the law, he asks the question, what further need would there be for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek? Essentially, what he's asking is a question. If uh, perfection would come through the Levitical, Aaronic priesthood, then why would God have made that oath? Uh, why would God have made this oath that he was going to bring about a new priest according to the order of Melchizedek? Obviously, the answer is that it, it would be superfluous. There would be no need for this new priest if, in fact, the priesthood that's derived from the authority of the law would accomplish his purpose. And so since it doesn't, since God made this promise, then the priesthood, according to the law, could not accomplish the purpose that God ultimately wants of a high priest. And so he says that, you know, there, there would be no need for another priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Verse 12 goes on to explain this connection between priesthood and law. Follow behind here, I think. Uh, the priesthood could not make you complete. Um, in fact, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 21, and you're going to see a lot of connections between what we look at in our class today and what Paul writes about in the book of Galatians. Uh, Paul asks the question here, is the law contrary to the promises of God? Well, certainly not. But Paul says, if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by law. But obviously, the point is, Paul was saying, law cannot do that. Law cannot grant righteousness. The law cannot give life. In fact, the only thing law could do was, in fact, bring death. And so Paul here is looking at the, the contrast between the law of Moses and the promise that God made to Abraham. What the writer of Hebrews is doing is essentially looking at the contrast between the priesthood that comes from the law of Moses and the oath that God made of a priesthood that would arise under the order of Melchizedek. So Paul, the writer of Hebrews makes this point here in, in chapter seven and verse 12, that if the priesthood changes, then the law that authorized the priesthood must also be changed. There simply was nothing that could be understood about the idea of a messianic of, of, a, of a messianic Jew. There was, you know, there's there's it's simply incomprehensible that someone could look for a Messiah under the law of Moses. That's the point the writer of Hebrews was trying to get them to realize that if you accept the fact that there is a Messiah who comes to become a high priest under the order of Melchizedek then he cannot be under the law of Moses. And in fact, the law of Moses itself can no longer exist when the Messiah. And so that's the point that the writer wants us to understand. The priesthood originates from the law of Moses. It authorized the priesthood from the tribe of Levi. But he says in verse 13, the one whom we are speaking about, verses 13 and 14, he descends from the tribe of Judah. And he says, when you look at the law, there is nothing in the law about someone from the tribe of Judah serving at the altar. In fact, we talked about a couple of examples in our class last week. Remember Isaiah, the priest who went to the, the tabernacle or went to the temple to burn incense. And remember how he was struck with leprosy because he of the tribe of Judah was trying to serve the role of the priest. And the priest 
uh, the true legitimate high priest followed him in there and told him that he must leave because he had no authority to be there. And in fact, he was struck with leprosy and was separated from the people of Israel for the remainder of his life. Earlier, we talked about King Saul, who was not of the tribe of Judah, but who was also not of the tribe of Levi. And King Saul had tried to serve as a priest. He had offered the sacrifice before going to war. And Samuel had condemned him for that. So the writer here is making this point that Jesus, who evidently, without any question, came from the tribe of Judah, could not be the high priest under the law of Moses. So anyone who is accepting Jesus as being the Messiah, that of course is the audience to whom this writer sent this epistle, could not find comfort. They could not find Jesus under the law of Moses. They could not find him as their high priest under the law of Moses. What he is doing is showing them, if you accept Jesus as the Messiah, then you must accept the fact that the law of Moses is ended. The law of Moses is no more. And we're going to see that with what we talked about today and what we talk about in our class next week. We're going to see this law of Moses brought to its conclusion, not destroyed, but simply brought to its conclusion, Jesus is going to fulfill it. And that's what he had promised he was going to do, as Dempsey pointed out in our study of last Wednesday. Uh, from Matthew chapter 5, he said, I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill the law. And so Jesus is going to fulfill the law, and in doing so, in becoming the Messiah, he brings this law to its end. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is trying to make clear to his audience, that this law is now brought to its end. What we have here is a very classic argument uh, based on silence. That's why I talked to you a moment ago about the definition of the word authority, literally meaning that which is allowed to be. If God says nothing about something, then what do we assume? Do we assume that it's okay for us to do it because God did not forbid it? Or do we assume that it's not okay for us to do so because God has not allowed it? And I think the writer of Hebrews has very clearly come down on this, on the latter viewpoint. That often is a very simplified definition of the distinction between those who are conservative and those who are liberal. Those who are conservative recognize that only that which God has allowed, that which God has authorized, is that which we ought to be participating in. While those who are liberal are those who say, as long as God has not forbidden it, then it's okay for us to do so. The author of Hebrews says, God said nothing about, the law says nothing about a priest who comes from the tribe of Levi. Therefore, Jesus cannot be a priest under the law of Moses. Jesus must be a priest by some different method. And that's the point that the writer wants us to understand here uh, about Jesus being a high priest and what that means about the law of Moses. Let me pause at this point uh, and see if anybody's got any, any questions or comments uh, about what we have talked about uh, up to this point. Just because I talked about silence doesn't mean everybody has to be silent. Well, I think one thing that's going on here, if I understand the context of this book correctly, it seems that there is some, probably some persecution that a lot of the Jewish Christians are enduring at this time, because you get over to chapter 10, he's like encouraging them, you know, to, he points out that they've endured and he's encouraging them to continue to endure. So, I mean, I may be reading between the lines, but I think the, the big concern here is that when you've got, if you've got Judaism and that's good, and you got Christianity that's better, but being a Christian is going to get you in a lot of trouble. The temptation is to say, well, Judaism, that, that was still good, right? That was still good enough. Let's not continue to be Christians if it's going to get us killed. Let's just go back to being Jews, and then we can still have this relationship with, with God. And I think the Hebrew writer is trying to head that off and say, look, it's not, it's not that Levi's okay and that 
Jesus Christ is okay, and you, you pick the one that's the most convenient for you. The, the priesthood of Levi, the old law, had its time and its place, but it's over now, and you you can't go back to that. It's it's not a choice. We are we are in Christ or we're not. If we're in Christ, we're with God, and if we're outside Christ, we're we're not with God. Uh, Mike, I think you're exactly right. Um, I, I think Paul alludes to this when he was writing. Uh, I can't remember now which book it was. It might have been Galatians, where he talks about the fact that uh, he was being persecuted because of the fact that he was preaching Christ. And essentially, that was the, the point he was making. He said, you know, I could choose the easy road of accepting the, the message of the circumcised, but instead, I, I can't do that. And he says, I'm being persecuted because I'm not preaching that message, and I can't preach that message. So, Mike, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, it was a great temptation for these Jewish Christians uh, because of the persecutions they faced uh, just to simply go back to that which would be easier for them. Uh, but the writer of Hebrews is trying to make it very clear. He says, you can't go back to that um, because it's, it's, it's ending. <laughs> it has ended for them. Exactly. And, you know, that's probably not a temptation that we have. You know, none of us, when persecution comes, None of us are going to say, well, let's just go back to the old law and just do the old law to avoid it because we were never we were never under the old law in the first place, so it's foreign to us. But I think a lot of Christians today, there's a temptation to take the New Testament and throw out anything which offends the world and say what's left. There's, there's still all these values in the New Testament. There's still these values that Christ teaches that don't offend the world, and let's just live by those. Let's just, let's just that's, isn't that still good enough? We're still being Christians. We're still walking in Christ. We're just avoiding the things that are going to step on people's toes. And uh, so I think that's where we fall into this temptation sometimes to try to find an easy path. But there, there isn't an easy path. There's one path, and you have to stay on it. Uh, excellent point. I, I think it's a very practical um, application of, of what we're seeing up to this point uh, in Hebrews. I, I agree with you fully. Uh, anybody else with any, any thoughts or comments uh, down through verse 14? All right, so his first argument was to recognize this idea of the, the new line of priest. And what that means is the law comes to an end. So let's talk about why this line of priest is superior in every way uh, to the line of priest that begins with Aaron, the sons of Levi. Um, the author of Hebrews is really going to spend the rest of chapter 7 talking about how that this priesthood is superior in, in every way, in every measure that you could take uh, to show that this is, in fact, better for them. And that's a, a term we're going to find as we go through here, uh, is this idea of better. I told you uh, back in our very first class, that's one of the key words in understanding the book of Hebrews, is the idea of that which is better. So the first point he's going to make is, in fact, how he became a high priest. Now, starting in verse 15, he says, this is clearer still. If another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who became such not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. Uh, I think the King James actually uses the word carnal there. Um, carnal not in the sense that uh, the, the priests were evil, uh, but carnal in the sense that it was based on that which is physical instead of that which is spiritual. So the priesthood that began with Aaron and continued through his son Eleazar and then his son Phineas and on down through the, the list, all the way through the priests that we read about in the time of Christ, each of those men became priests based on a physical feature, uh, literally their genealogy. Uh, and so if they were born with the right DNA, if they came from the right father, the, then they became high priest. Um, and so that was the basis by which they became high priest. Yet, how does Jesus become high priest? Well, how did Melchizedek become high priest? It was determined by God. And as the author has already pointed out, with Melchizedek, he did not have father or descendant uh, or son. 
that, that doesn't mean literally that he didn't have an earthly father or didn't literally have any children, but nothing is recorded about that. And so from the viewpoint of, of history, he has no father, he has no son. In other words, he didn't become a priest based upon whom his father was. And when he died, someone didn't take his place because of the fact that they were his descendants. That's the point. Melchizedek was a priest perpetually. And so for the Messiah to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek, he becomes a priest because of his indestructible life. Again, what was the oath? From Psalm 110, it's quoted again here in verse 17. You are a priest according to the order of Melchizedek forever. So the term forever there is being emphasized. You are a high priest forever. So it is superior because he'll never be replaced. But he is a priest who abides forever. The second argument that the writer is going to make is the fact that he is a superior high priest because of how what authorizes him to be priest. We already talked about this earlier from verses 11 through 14. The, the authority under which Aaron became high priest was the law of Moses. Uh, we read about in the book of Exodus where Moses had gone up into the mountain. He received from God the law. We find within that the, the uh, articles of the, the vestments that Aaron was to wear, the, the uh, turban that he wore, the robes that he wore, uh, the ephod that he wore, the, uh, the, the, the golden plate that went on the, the front of the turban, all of these things were aspects of the law. They were all what gave him his authority, gave him his, his holiness, gave him his grandeur, uh, put him in this position to be the, the representative of the people before God. All of that came from the law. But what do we find with, with the Messiah? What do we find with the Son? It says on verse uh, verse 18, for on the one hand, there's a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and its uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect, but on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. So you had a law that was weak and useless. Does that mean that God made a mistake with the law? Well, of course not. In fact, we're going to see in just a moment what the law served its purpose to do. But what it could not do, ultimately, was to bring man back to God. The law simply could not do that. And so with Aaron as their high priest, the people of Israel essentially could get no nearer to God than they had been before. In fact, when you come to Sinai, that, distinct, that's, that point is made very clear. When they came to Mount Sinai, what was the first thing that God told Moses to do? He told him to put a fence around the mountain to keep anybody from coming and setting foot on the mountain. Even if an oxen was to set a foot on the mountain, that oxen would die. And that was to show that the people could not come to God. They were still separated from God. And the law of Moses, Aaron could not bring them any closer than that. It just simply did not have that power within it. It was weak and ineffectual to make them perfect, to bring them in the presence of God. Uh, but the oath, on the other hand, does bring man closer to God because it has a better hope. It has a better promise. We're going to see that uh, particularly when we get into our class next week. We're going to see in every in what this do oath does what it does to bring about this this change from the man being unable to be in the presence of God coming to God where now man can come to God but that's the, the second point that the author wants us to understand is why this new line of priest is superior because it does what the law could not do the third point he's going to do argue is the fact of the oath itself there's something unique about that. When you go to verse 20, uh, there in Hebrews chapter 7, inasmuch as it was not without an oath. That's what we find there in Psalm 110, is the Lord swore that he was to be a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. 
We've actually seen this idea already back in chapter 6. If you go back to chapter 6, remember the promise that God made to Abraham? Uh, chapter 6 and verse 13, when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and I will multiply you. And thus, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath is given as confirmation and end to every dispute. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show the heirs of the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose, he interposed with an oath. So God swore to Abraham, and God swears to his Messiah. And he, in both cases, he makes an oath. He makes this promise. It's for the sake of the recipient, not for God's sake, but for the sake of the recipient so that we understand how sure this is. And yet when you look in the book of Exodus, you look in the book of Leviticus, you look in the book of Numbers, and you look at all of the grandeur that had to come along with Aaron as being a high priest. We read about the washings that he went through. We read about the special clothes that were made for him. We read about the sacrifices that were offered when he was consecrated to become a high priest. There is not one word about an oath. There is nothing about an oath of God in there. And in fact, when his son Eleazar became high priest, again, there's nothing about an oath. At the end of the book of Joshua, when Eleazar died and Phineas becomes the high priest, again, there is nothing about an oath. And in fact, there was nothing in any of the examples that we read about in the scripture when one man replaced another as high priest that there was an oath of God. The writer of Hebrews is telling us that's significant. He says in verse 21, for they indeed became priests without an oath, but he became priest with an oath through the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. What we find here is just a fantastic expository sermon by the writer of Hebrews who's taking Psalm 110 and he's expounding upon what that means for us. Now, this is like the third time now that he's quoted this passage, making a different point each time about something that is found within just that one verse. And so here he's shown us the, the significance of this oath that makes it superior. And so then finally in verse 23, the last of the arguments that he makes to show the superiority of this priesthood. He says, the former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. One of the questions that I asked you last week to consider is, which is better, many or one? And the writer of Hebrews makes it very clear that one is better than many. And we're going to see why one is better than many because the one can do what the many could not do. Uh, Josephus, in his book of Antiquities, tells us that there were 83 high priests, uh, beginning with Aaron, continuing up until the time Jerusalem was destroyed. Uh, interestingly, when you think about Aaron being appointed as high priest, the timeline is significant. While Moses was up on the law of, of Sinai, receiving the law from God, the law that was going to make Aaron as a high priest, what was Aaron doing at that time? Well, Exodus chapter 32 tells us what he was doing. He was satisfying the desire of the people of Israel who said, make us a God who will lead us back to Egypt. And he is the one who told them, bring me your gold. And he had fashioned a golden calf and then presented it to the people of Israel and said, this is your God. Now that is the man whom God is choosing to be his high priest. Aaron did not become the high priest until Leviticus chapter 8. After the tabernacle had been, resurrect, had been um, uh, erected by Moses according to the pattern, which we'll see next week, and after he has been washed and the robes have been prepared and they're placed upon him, then in Leviticus chapter 8, he is consecrated to become the high priest. And yet, what kind of a person is Aaron as a high priest? He's flawed. This is a man who is already flawed when he becomes high priest. Uh, 
So that tells us he's not perfect. How can he make the people perfect if he is not perfect? How could he offer sacrifices for them? Well, it tells us he had to first offer sacrifices for himself before he could then go back into the Holy of Holies and offer the sacrifices for the people. And his son Eleazar and his son Phineas, and all the way down through the lineage, every one of those high priests was flawed. They could not be perfect. They could not make man perfect. And so the people that they represented, the people that they served as high priests, had somebody representing them and serving them who was imperfect, who was flawed. But what does the writer tell us here in, in back in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24? On the other hand, because he abides forever, he holds his priesthood permanently. And therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. I can remember uh, the vehicle that we used to have, uh, our minivan. Uh, we've gone to the dealership a number of times, and we developed a relationship with uh, one of the service advisors there at the dealership. We'd seen him a number of times. Uh, he was really good that if there was some kind of a problem, he would explain it well to us. He would make sure the, the technicians did their job right. And a, couple, a couple of times when it wasn't done right, you know, he would make it right. Uh, and, and so we had developed this relationship with him. We kind of entrusted our vehicle to him. And then we went back one time and he had either quit or been fired. And we were in a relatively low value devastated uh, because we no longer had that representative, that one that we could trust. Uh, I suspect the same thing happens sometimes with a doctor. You go to a doctor that you've gone to for years and years and years, and then the doctor retires. And you've put your life in his hands, and now he's not there anymore. And, you know, maybe even introduce, you know, here's the, the new doctor, and they bring in this kid who's 12 years old, just got out of medical school, and said, yeah, he's going to be your doctor. And, no, no, I want Dr. Welby. I, I want the guy who's, you know, been there forever. He's known me forever. I don't want Doogie Hauser. Uh, we want the one that we trust, the, the one that, you know, has been there for us over and over and over again. With the people of Israel, Aaron died. Eleazar died. Phineas died. All of these men died. And a new man became high priest. Uh, look at the examples that we find where they came to Samuel and said, we don't want your sons to be priest over us. Uh, they're evil. They're corrupt. We don't want them to be our priests. Um, but with Jesus as our high priest, he's there today, and he'll be there tomorrow, and he'll be there the next day, and again, and again, and again. Someone that we can put our trust in, someone who that represents us before God, and he does so perfectly, and he lives forever, and he will be there as our intercessor forever. That's the point that the writer is making. That's why he is superior to the high priest under the uh, Aaronic priesthood, under the law of Moses. Jesus is the one who is there forever. Let me pause at this point and see if anybody's got any uh, comments or questions. When we look at these four different ways now in which he is superior, uh, his priesthood is superior to that of Aaron. Does anybody have any, any comments or any questions? Eddie, on, uh, on the latter part of verse 16 there where it says, but according to the power of an indestructible life, of course, that we know that Christ had, he, he, he was resurrected. I'm reminded of when Paul makes the argument uh, for the resurrection, that if, if the resurrection uh, didn't occur, then we are of all men to be much pitied. <laughs> we, our whole uh, salvation is based on, on the resurrection, and that, that qualifies uh, 
Christ to be a high priest forever, the fact that he was resurrected. Exactly. Resurrected to die no more. We read of other people in the Bible that were resurrected, uh, Lazarus and, and a number of others, but they died again. Uh, he is resurrected never to die again. And that, uh, that is what qualifies him to be a superior high priest. I appreciate the comment. Uh, anybody else? Hey, Eddie, I appreciate your summary of the chapter on Melchizedek and that perpetuity of him in uh, verse three comes out when he says he's made like the son of God. So that's it, it, it's typically the other way around. Jesus is like Melchizedek, but Melchizedek uh, is made like the son of God in that sense, mm -hmm. uh, perpetuity. And the argument of... Uh, Silence really is not new here in chapter 7 when he seven, says in verse 14, Moses spoke nothing concerning Judah and uh, the priesthood. And in chapter 1, he's already used that line of reasoning when he says in verse 5, for to which of the angels did he ever say, thou art my son today, I have begotten thee. Uh, when, when God said that in Psalm 2, it, it certainly wasn't said to the angels. Uh, and then in verse 13 of that chapter, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand? Uh, and so when he comes to chapter 7 and verse 3, without father, without mother, without genealogy, you know, silence is, I think, the argument there. None recorded. Right. Uh, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a priesthood based on pedigree or genealogy, but on special appointment. But uh, it, it's not a new, it's not a, something new. It's not a new argument that he's suddenly introducing here, this idea of silence. He's used it already uh, in the letter. And uh, he expects his readers to, to respect that. Yes. Now that, uh, it, it's sad to say so many do not respect. Um, where God has not spoken, they, they think that that gives them the authority to just step in uh, and to, to speak what God has done. And that, that's very dangerous ground indeed. Anybody else with any um, uh, thoughts or comments uh, down through verse 25? Well, I, I titled this lesson, The Priest of the Oath. And I think the author here in the last three verses is gonna kind of summarize uh, these concepts that he's introduced about Melchizedek and how they apply to Jesus. I think he's going to summarize that all together. Uh, what we have seen is a, a number of different kinds of argument, lines of argument. It, it, it's, it's actually an excellent study in just logic, uh, the book of Hebrews. Uh, and particularly this chapter, uh, we find a, a variety of different forms of logic uh, where the author has, uh, has argued very logically to prove a point. Now he's going to bring it to its conclusion uh, here in the beginning of verse 26. And, and he says, it is fitting. Um, and that really is the point of the book of Hebrews uh, all the way through, is to talk about what is appropriate, what is fitting. Uh, now, the word itself is used in chapter 2 and verse 10. Uh, going back and looking at, at chapter 2 and verse 10, he says, it is fitting for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their, of their salvation through suffering. As I pointed out, that, that seems very ironic that God through the Holy Spirit is essentially saying it is fitting for my Savior to suffer. Uh, but indeed, that's, that's the point that he goes on to argue. Well, now he's using the same basic concept and he's saying it is fitting, it's appropriate that we have this kind of a high priest. So what is this kind of a high priest? Well, he says he is holy, he is innocent, he is undefiled, he is separated from sinners, he is exalted above the heavens. Those are all different ways of saying the same thing. What we have is a high priest who is perfect. We saw that back in chapter five. Remember, he was made perfect. And again, 
perfect doesn't just mean without sin. In fact, the writer of Hebrews makes it clear there in chapter 5, the idea of being made perfect means that he was fully qualified. One of those qualifications is obviously without sin. Chapter 4 makes that point. But it's much more than just simply being without sin. It's one who, as he has argued here, has become a high priest forever, fulfills the promise of the oath that God made in Psalm 110. So notice these things about this high priest. He's holy, he's innocent, undefiled, separated from sinner, exalted from the heaven. But remember the life of Jesus. Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh, Paul tells us. Jesus ate with sinners. Remember the complaints that Jesus was eating with the sinners. Matthew had, um, had, a, had a, a party, a feast, and invited all of his sinner friends, the tax collectors, uh, to come and to meet Jesus. Jesus welcomed sinners. Remember Zacchaeus and how that Jesus said, I am going to your house this day. And yet, Jesus was separate from them. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that Jesus was aloof from them. But the writer of Hebrews tells us that he is separated from sinners. In other words, Jesus was not drugged down with them. But instead, Jesus was lifting them up. Now, contrast that to the high priest under the law. The high priest under the law would often have nothing to do with sinners. In fact, that was the uh, that's what we find in the first century. They're criticizing Jesus because he was with the sinners. They would have nothing to do with him. The only thing they would do with the sinners is to condemn them from a distance. And yet, what does the Bible tell us? The Bible tells us that, in fact, they were worse than the sinners because they thought they were better than the sinners. Uh, Luke chapter 15, the Dempsey talked about uh, this the past Wednesday. The story of the prodigal son and the story of the lost coins and the lost sheep, all of them started from this foundation. It's found in the first two verses. The tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to him, to Jesus, to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. They would not touch those sinners with a 10-foot pole. And yet, they were, in fact, worse than those sinners because of that. Remember what Jesus had said when he healed the man who had been born blind? And then the, the, the Sanhedrin called an inquest together because this was done on the Sabbath day. And Jesus said about them, as long as you say we see, you continue to be blind. And that was the problem with them, is they held themselves to be aloof. And in doing so, they were, in fact, beneath the ones that they would have nothing to do with. So he says, it is fitting that we should have this kind of a high priest. Next, he says in verse 27, who does not need to daily offer sacrifice. Uh, a few years ago, I remember hearing Paul Earnhardt uh, talk about a, 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 a preacher down in Australia when the uh, Billy Graham was uh, planning to do one of his first campaigns in Australia. And uh, the preacher there, kind of in a fit of jealousy, said, we don't need Billy Graham to bring his bloody religion here. And, and Paul Earnhardt pointed out that, in fact, that's exactly what Christianity is. It is a religion of blood. When you look back at the Old Testament, and you look at the sacrifices that were required of the people of Israel, they offered sacrifices daily. That meant there was death. There was bloodshed every single day. And yet ultimately the writer of Hebrews is telling us Jesus does not need to do that every day. He doesn't have to, first of all, offer sacrifices for his own failings, his own flaws, and then turn around and offer sacrifices for the sins of the people again every day because he said he did it one time for all. Remember my question earlier about one and many, which is better? That doesn't apply just to the priest. It also applies to the sacrifice. Is one sacrifice better than many sacrifices? We're impressed by Solomon when he dedicated the temple. 
in the tens of thousands of animals that were slaughtered in the sacrifice to dedicate the temple. But we need to be much more impressed by one sacrifice that was offered by one person. That is the Messiah of God who offered one sacrifice for all time for all men. That's what the writer of Hebrews wants us to understand. He offered this one permanent sacrifice. Just as a side note, that's the problem with any kind of religion that would have us to believe that as a part of our worship, we are once again sacrificing the blood of Christ. That simply is a false religion because it diminishes the value of the one sacrifice that Jesus offered for all time. And then finally, notice what he says in verse 28. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak. Again, does this mean the law was wrong or somehow God made a mistake? He shouldn't have chosen Aaron. He should have chosen a, a different line. No, men themselves were weak. This is again why I pointed out that Aaron, even before he became high priest, had, had demonstrated his flaws before God. But the law still appoints him as a priest. It's, it's very clear. The message that God is giving them is, even though this is the law I'm giving you, this is not going to make you perfect. The law itself cannot make you perfect. The law could only appoint weak men to become high priests before God. But the oath, the oath that God gave to, uh, uh, in Psalm 110, through David or one of his descendants, that oath appoints a priest forever. But notice what the writer says here. He, po he points out the fact that there's a timeline. He says there in the middle part of verse 28, the oath came after the law. So the law cannot supplant the oath. Again, remember the point that Mike made very early in, in our study. This book is written to people, its immediate application is to people who had been under the law of Moses, were familiar with the law of Moses, could look, you know, were tempted to go back to the law of Moses as a security blanket. And yet he's trying to show them that the law could not supplant that oath. The oath came after the law, so the oath must be supplanting the law not the other way around. The oath is that which comes after the law, and it's a promise of God that the law would end. Yet, that oath, as we saw back in chapter 6, is based on a promise that came before the law. Remember back in chapter 6, where we talked about the, the promise that God made to Abraham, which was given by an oath, and in fact, this promise that he makes here in Psalm 110 is based on that promise that God had made to Abraham. And so what we find is a promise that came before the law and an oath that comes after the law. And both of them are demonstrating, ultimately requiring, that the law must come to an end. And they simply cannot use the law as their salvation, as their touchstone, as their comfort. They had to turn away from it. That's the point that the author wants them to understand. It has come to an end. And you simply cannot look at that as your salvation anymore. Uh, here's the quote from uh, Hebrews chapter 6 that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and so finally, the last thing he says there in verse 28, that the oath appoints a son made perfect forever. And again, I will emphasize what we had seen back in chapter uh, 2 and again in chapter 5, the fact that Jesus, it was fitting, it was appropriate that Jesus had to go through the suffering. He had to go through the temptations. He had to learn obedience so that by doing so, he could be made perfect. He could be made complete. All right, does anybody have any, any questions or comments then about what we have talked about up to that point? And this is the passage from Galatians 3, where Paul argues about the fact that the promise came 400 years before uh, the, I mean, 
uh, the law came 430 years after the promise. And so therefore it could not change the promise that God made to Abraham. Anybody with any thoughts or questions uh, about what we talked about today? All right, let me give you some questions to consider for uh, chapter eight, which we're going to look at next week. Uh, what is the sanctuary, the true tabernacle of God? Um, I think Dipsy had answered this in, a, uh, in one of our classes a few weeks ago on Wednesday. But again, I want you to consider that. What is the sanctuary? What is the true tabernacle that the author will talk about here in uh, uh, in in chapter 8, verse 2. Uh, second question, why are patterns important? And we've kind of alluded to that in our study this evening. Uh, why are patterns important? This third question, this is the one that I really want you to think about. So this is what we're going to focus on mostly next week. What is different about the new covenant that God promised? Uh, the quotation comes from Jeremiah chapter 31. Uh, in verses 31 through 34, the author of Hebrews quotes it in chapter 8, verses 8 through 12. But he talks about the fact that there's going to be a new covenant, which is going to be different. And I want you to consider all the many ways in which it is different. Now, I'm afraid that far too often we really don't focus on the different, all the, the manifold ways in which it is different. And then finally, the last question I want you to think about, and I've, again, I've alluded to it a lot in our class this evening. What does the promise of the new covenant mean for the old covenant? So anyway, uh, keep those thoughts in mind. Uh, if anybody's got any, any comments to make before we end our class, um, speak now forever hold your peace, I guess. Um, We'll have somebody uh, lead a study for us, but let me find my who's on here. Uh, Dan Byers, I think I see you on there. Would you mind unmuting yourself and, and, and lead a prayer for us here at the end of our class? Okay, I will. All right, All right. Let's pray. Our dear holy God and Father, we come before you. We thank you for this study. We thank you for our high priest. We see that he is so much better and offers us so, so much better promises and, and the grace that comes through him. We're thankful for him. Help us to allow this to be the, the thing that causes us to hold on to him, and not I let anything supplant him. Be with us in our week as Christians to serve thee and to serve others. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen.